Okay, so the third way of fixing these common pool resource issues, um, rather than using the private sector or the public sector, is to rely on informal solutions or to rely on informal institutions, which we've been talking about throughout the semester here. And so institutions are important. Um, hopefully that's one thing that you'll remember from this class um, beyond like supply and demand and things crossing and plugging stuff into Desmos is that institutions shape our behavior and shape the incentives that we face. Um, we follow informal institutions, even though they're not written down because it's in our best interest to it makes society run smoothly. Um, if we go back to the example we keep using of like if you crash into the door with, doorway with somebody, there are informal institutions that decide who needs to go through the door, doorway first. If you flout those institutions, if you're supposed to let the older person go through, but you go through before the older person, then you'll get shamed. Um, if people see you, they'll um, look at you funny. Um, there's, there's actual consequences to violating these informal institutions. Even if we don't think they're super important or if we think they're dumb, we can still be locked into them. Um, so in the play Hamilton, for example, um, it shows several duels and dueling was a weird informal institution that we had in the United States and in England and in France and in Russia. Um, it was all over the place in the early 1800s and late 1700s where you could defend your honor by engaging in a duel. Um, and there were all sorts of rules around duels. Um, you could get out of them if you pointed your gun up at the sky at the last minute to show that you're not really going to shoot the other person, but you're still maintaining your honor. You didn't chicken out. Um, but then you can get misfiring where like one person goes up and the other person doesn't want to shoot them, but they end up shooting them um, because they m miscalculated. It's a mixed strategy game theory game. Um, and even at the time, people thought this was a stupid system. Um, because you, like, people died all the time from these duels and got severely injured um, in the name of honor. Um, and so in the musical Hamilton, they actually like um, make fun of this idea, but it was a, a common um, sentiment back then. Um, so here, um, this is Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton talking to each other, and they say that, like, can we agree that duels are dumb and immature? And then Hamilton says, sure, but your man has to answer for his words. And with his life in this duel, we both know that's absurd. And so everybody knew that this was a really awkward, inefficient system to just kill people over insults. Um, but they were still locked into the system because these informal institutions, the shaming that came from violating them was very strong. And so you just had to keep doing it, even if it was a bad idea. Um, so as a result, these informal institutions um, shape all sorts of policy, even if they're not written down. So presidential term limits, um, this is a fascinating example because it was not um, a constitutional amendment um, that you could, or part of the constitution or anything, um, up until 1944, that you should only run for president for two terms. That was an informal institution, an informal norm that existed from the time of George Washington up until um, FDR. And then he violated that institution and ran for a third term and then ran for a fourth term and then died in the middle of the fourth term. Um, and that was that was weird. And so what ended up happening was um, there was an institutional, a formal institutional fix for that. Um, the 22nd Amendment was so FDR was elected to his fourth term in 1944. Um, and then the 22nd Amendment was ratified just a few later in early 1950 um, as a formal fix to that violation of these informal norms. Um, presidential personal finances, this is another norm that um, has existed for decades um, where presidential candidates were generally expected to release their tax forms um, to show their personal holdings. Um, if they owned businesses, the, the norm was to divest from your businesses. Um, Jimmy Carter from Georgia had stake in a peanut farm and he had to divest himself from his peanut farm to run for president. Um, and so that was just kind of the, the informal system. None of that was written down anywhere. There was no legal requirement to do that. Uh, it was just a thing you did. Up until 2016, when Donald Trump flouted those informal institutions and um, uh, violated them all. And so as a result, um, there was kind of a formal fix to it. Um, several states tried to pass laws in 2017 and 2018 and 2019. Um, that required that if you wanted to be on that state's ballot for president, you had to divulge your personal finances. 
Um, Maryland, I think, was one of the states that, that did this. Um, but without doing it at a federal level, it doesn't have much teeth. And so there was kind of an attempt to formalize the, uh, to, to fix the violation of the informal institution with a formal um, fix, but it doesn't necessarily work. Um, we also see this with the, the Senate idea of the filibuster, where any senator can hold up a piece of legislation. Um, technically, it start, this idea of the filibuster started um, decades ago where a senator could stand up on the floor and speak for hours and hours and hours, and they had to stand up and be speaking the whole time to hold up debate and hold up votes. Um, nowadays, they don't have to. They just have to like press a button that says, I'm filibustering. Um, and so that, that's all they have to do to filibuster stuff now. Um, but both parties, um, whenever one of the parties is in power, there's a temptation to um, kind of remove that institution of the filibuster and make it illegal, essentially, to remove that, that section from the rules, eliminate that informal institution of the, the filibuster and make it so you can't hold up legislation indefinitely. But there's a hesitation if you're the party in power to do that because you'll often be out of power a few years later and you want to use the filibuster in your favor. And so um, in American politics, we call this the nuclear option is removing filibuster power. Um, and this does happen occasionally. Um, for federal judicial appointments, there's, the Senate cannot engage in filibusters anymore um, because that power was, was taken away a few years ago. Um, the Senate majority voted to get rid of the filibuster rule. Um, and make it illegal so that you, you can't filibuster anymore for federal judicial appointments. Um, but then as a result, um, under the Trump administration, tons of federal judges have been sailing through because there's no filibuster um, to stop them. Um, so in all of these situations, um, these, these all started off as informal institutions, just things that you should do because it is good to do. Um, and then when they got violated, um, it led to formal fixes of them. And so FDR ran for a third and fourth term. We got an amendment fairly immediately. Um, Donald Trump did not divulge his tax information, did not divest from his businesses. Um, the Southern District of New York has been pursuing all sorts of legal cases against um, conflicts of interest with Trump holdings in, in New York. Um, states have been trying to um, remove Trump from the ballot because he's not producing his, his financial statements. So there are attempts to fix these things at a formal level. Um, but one problem with this, as we've talked about in past sessions here, is that if you make something formal, um, it changes the incentives. Now you have extrinsic motivations. Now you will only follow um, specific guidelines. Um, you won't divulge your presidential finances because it's the right thing to do. If there's a requirement that says you must show these tax forms, then most presidential candidates are going to show those tax forms only because now the law says to only do this and so you can do the bare minimum and get away with it. Um, and so in all these situations, you can, you can get the formal fix, but it might erase the informal institution behind it and erase the spirit of the law and replace it with just the letter of the law and you can violate kind of the spirit because that's gone now. So it is, it is sometimes dangerous to replace these informal institutions with the formal versions of them. Um, but also these informal institutions, the reason we care about them so much is you can use them to help enforce um, um, social contracts. And you can use them to fix common pool resource problems and market failures and other um, issues that you have with the provision of public goods. Um, one of the main researchers in this field of using informal institutions for um, fixing public goods issues is Eleanor Ostrom here. Um, she was a political scientist at Indiana University up until 2012 um, when she died. Um, in 2009, she was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics, even though she was not an economist, she's a political scientist. She was also the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in Economics, um, which is great because one, like, she's not an economist, but she still got the Nobel Prize. Um, since then, there's only been one other woman to get the Nobel Prize, and that was in 2019, Esther Duflo. Um, won the Nobel Prize, and you'll read an article by her in the, in the last session, session 15. Um, and so she does really important work that's become famous all around the world. Um, and the stuff that she looks at is how informal institutions can actually shape governance um, and can shape ac people's access to public goods. And so one of the um, 
One of the illustrations she gave in the chapters that you read from Governing the Commons was of fishermen working here. This is Alanya, Turkey here. It's a small um, tourist village, fishing village in Turkey. Um, and what she found in her research about Alanya was that there was natural overfishing. Um, there were a hundred fishermen in the city um, and they would they would wake up super early, they'd rush out to the best spots, they would overuse the best spots and then rush back home and they would wake up earlier and earlier and so it was divulging into this commons issue with this race out to, to get kind of the best fish and then the least, the next the next best fish and then the next best fish and then everybody was just kind of overusing the commons in general. Um, but what she found um, was that these fishermen recognized that they were um, kind of engaging in this arms race and overfishing and leading to bad outcomes. And so what they did was as a community, they came together to figure out some informal system for addressing the overfishing. Um, and so what they ended up doing was by themselves, the Turkish government didn't show up in the village and say, here's what you're going to do now. It was just the fishermen themselves got together and said, we need to fix this. So they invented a rotating system for fishing sites. Um, and so you could fish in one section of the bay for a week, and then the next week you could move to a different section. Um, and so that fixed kind of the parceling idea that we talked about a couple sections ago, where if you get a bad parcel, sucks to be you, with this rotating system, if you get a bad parcel, you wait a week, and then you can have a better parcel, and then you can move around to different parcels in that bay, or in the fishing grounds in general. Um, when people cheat and when there's violations, they actually had a whole community judicial system that they invented um, and they handled violations in the town coffee house. And so if somebody cheated, they got all sorts of public shaming. They invented different types of fines in the community, um, but it was all very self-policed and self-enforced. Um, fishermen still had to be licensed. Um, but you didn't go through the Turkish government, you went through the village and the kind of the guild of fishermen and um, you got permission to go out and get put into the rotating system and it worked and they were able to fix the overfishing um, and it, it ended up being a fairly equitable, just system that had equal access to everybody and people were happy with it. And they had systems in place to punish um, people who defected and who violated those norms. Um, and the key to having this work here was that this local solution that they just kind of invented by themselves had legitimacy and had authority. The fishermen subjected themselves to the authority of the other fishermen. And the reason this solution had legitimacy and authority is because they all knew each other. It was a, it was a community-based effort. And so they all knew their families for decades. And so they were invested in making sure that the system worked. They didn't want to overfish because it was all of their livelihoods. They were all very invested in this. Um, and so it worked well. Um, and so what's, what's interesting here is if you want to replicate this in other places, it's kind of hard. Um, because this institution worked, this informal rotating institution in Alanya worked well because there were already pre-existing good institutions and good community bonds with people. And those existed because they were built on previous good bonds with people. So for decades, these families had been working together and they knew each other. And so if you want to recreate this thing, you essentially get this, this idea of like good institutions exist because of prior good institutions, which also exist because of good prior institutions. And so you end up with this whole turtles all the way down situation um, based on this, this old myth where um, somebody was asking like where the world is and somebody said like it's sitting on top of a turtle and then where's that turtle standing it's standing on another turtle and it's just turtles all the way down um, you can have good institutions all the way down and so in Alanya it worked because you had a good foundation of good institutions but that became because of prior good institutions um, but if you have a situation where that works, where you know that there's strong community bonds um, and you know that people know each other and there's ways of, of enforcing rules, um, you can actually um, create good norms in those communities based on those good institutions and generate self-generated institutions. So people in close-knit groups um, in communities naturally create norms that try to maximize welfare for everybody and that then enforce themselves for everybody. Um, and so this is something we want to take advantage of. It's hard to just swoop in and place good institutions in a society somewhere and say, go. 
um, she gives an example of a different um, fishing village in Turkey um, where they tried to do this um, called Bodrum, Turkey, but it didn't actually work because there were too many fishermen and they didn't have close knit ties to everybody in the society. Um, and so as a result, you could cheat. And um, you, if you got punished, oh well, it wasn't bad because you could just move to a different part of the city and you wouldn't like the shame wouldn't follow you because it was a bigger community. And so it was really hard to enforce those norms. But if you have a smaller, close-knit community, you can actually enforce these norms, and they're very powerful. Um, this idea of these self-reinforcing norms and self-enforcing norms um, is actually one of the motivations for this uh, movement to defund the police. And this is based, um, so some of Eleanor Ostrom's early research um, looked at policing in American cities. And so what she found is that cities that have smaller police forces that are focused just on like policing instead of um, fixing mental health issues and providing foster care services and everything else that we've kind of bundled all together as police services nowadays. Um, she found that um, communities with smaller forces have better community enforcement of norms and there's less of a reliance on um, actual police for resolving disputes. Um, and so as a result, you kind of get a better community response. And so rather than calling 911 to fix every issue, um, you can engage in community policing and community justice. Um, this whole idea right here is kind of um, the theoretical background behind the restorative justice movement, um, which is an alternative to policing. So if you have somebody that violates a norm or a law in a community, rather than calling the police and having them get arrested and sticking them in jail for five years or whatever, um, you use the community bonds and the the ties between community members to enforce informal institutions and essentially create kind of that Turkish coffee house where you can punish um, the, the defectors and punish the people who violate the norms. And as a community, you figure out how to punish that and how to help the person stop doing that in the future. Um, and so rather than focusing on just like aggressive justice and, and kind of revenge-based justice, you have restorative justice where you try to get the person back into the community and reincorporate it into that good institutional structure that you have. And as a result, you can address these, these uh, market failures, um, these public goods provisions issues, these common pool resource problems, um, if you focus on strong community ties. Um, which is also a reason why we've been talking so much about institutions throughout this class. Um, they are crucial to fixing public goods problems. We can't just rely on the government for everything, for all provision of public goods, um, because incentives get messed up. If we rely on the police and bundle every single possible social ill as um, police responsibilities, then suddenly community ties disappear and the incentive to follow the law disappears and the, the incentive to enforce the law equitably and justly and nonviolently also can disappear. Um, but if we rely strongly on community bonds and strong informal institutions, um, then we can have better forms of justice and um, less violent police. Um, and so this is a good thing that we want to pursue using these informal institutions. And so it's a good potential solution for this. It doesn't work all the time. Um, as I mentioned before, Bodrum, Turkey did not work um, with the rotating system because there were more fishermen instead of having one single cooperative that met in a copy in a coffee house there were multiple um, cooperatives and so if you violated the norms of one you could move to a different one and if you could somehow conceal your, your identity or make it so that the one crop cooperative that you cheated didn't tell the other one then you can do whatever you want um, there were also more tourists and so there are more financial incentives um, to control the beaches more and to bring in more fish for tourists. And so it was more messed up. It was far less simple than, um, than Alanya. And so if you want to fix something like climate change or something really, really difficult and protracted, um, relying solely on, inst on informal institutions is going to be really hard. We can't really just have all countries meet in a coffee shop um, to hammer out details about how to reduce carbon. We need a whole bunch of other systems to do that. We still need institutional norms. We need kind of a norm to, non em to not emit, but we also need kind of stronger enforcement mechanisms. We need private sector solutions and public sector solutions and these informal institutional norms all at the same time for kind of these bigger issues. But for smaller issues, 
informal institutions work great. 